Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest panel webinar from Business Gateway. Over the, the pandemic, we've run a number of these, just basically trying to help people uh, understand the various things that are, are going on. Um, this is the latest, and this is in line with the, the work that's going on to reopen retail and close contact businesses. So welcome this morning. We're going to give folks a few minutes because it just takes a wee bit of while to, to get through the, the login for GoToWebinar. So while we're, we're doing that, I'm going to give you a wee bit of uh, general housekeeping to flag to yourselves. We will be recording the session and it will be made available afterwards to share with other business owners who, who aren't able to attend today. Um, everyone's been placed on mute to avoid background noise. And as you perhaps know, we asked everyone uh, to submit questions if they had in advance. And we'll try and get through as many of those as we can during the session. Um, we have a superb panel for you this morning. Um, if there's anything that we don't have the time to cover today, we will follow up with any suitable supporting resources and we'll share any relevant feedback on the session with Scottish Government to follow up any issues that we might identify. So, without further ado, um, let me ask the panel to, in, to uh, basically introduce themselves and, and where they're from. Susan, can I come to you first? Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Susan Love. I'm the Head of External Affairs for the FSB, Federation of Small Businesses in Scotland. Thanks, Susan. Brian. Well, thanks for welcoming me back, Hugh and colleagues. Um, my name is Brian Laurie. I'm an Environmental Health Officer with South Ayrshire Council and also the Chair of the National uh, Trading Standards Environmental Health um, Coordinating Expert Group. That's grand. Thanks, Brian. And Ewan. Thanks, Hugh. This is my debut on this, so it's very exciting. I'm Head of Policy and External Affairs for the Scottish Retail Consortium, the Lead Trade Association for the Retail Industry. Wonderful. Thanks, Ewan. And I'm Hugh Lightbody. I'm Chief Officer for the Business Gateway National Unit in COSLA. So without further ado, let's get going. And the, the first things we wanted to, to really kind of cover are some of the kind of key discussion points that arise from the, the work that's been going on. So. Um, we've got guidance at the moment for the sector. We're expecting updated guidance from the Scottish Government on the reopening of the retail and close contact services sector. Um, that is available or will be available when the new guidance comes out on the Scottish Government website. Ewan, can I start with yourself? What, what were the key things from you on the guidance that, that businesses basically need to know about? I think, thanks, Hugh. I think probably for us, the, the first thing we, we certainly got from discussions with, with government and our review is actually government felt they went quite a long way quite quickly, um, particularly in how they looked at it. The guidance had to happen quite swiftly because we opened up homewares and garden centres a little earlier, which is great news to get a little bit of trading going along. So that was certainly a kind of a positive thing. I think the big sort of insights we got were on the timing on, and the big questions about when things open. The vaccination programme is crucial to the way government is viewing this. They see that as the, the silver bullet that's going to allow things to return sustainably and, and stave off future lockdowns. So that's that's a kind of big overarching thing. To pick up on, on some of the specifics, the biggest change from the previous guidance is on ventilation. That's to do with the work the scientific committee have done. They've worked out, particularly with the new strains we've got of COVID, then it's that ability to, to get air flowing through your shop to make sure that you know, you've got that coming in. Now, for people with a big store, that's about how your air conditioning units work, about how you make sure that's done. For smaller format, it's about opening doors and windows. It's not complicated, but that's a, quite a big change. We've got a lot of emphasis on that. I think the other stuff is that you know things are hopefully going to relax back to where they were in lots of cases. So we're going to see things like click and collect are obviously able to open up now. The restrictions on that should go from the 26th as well. That will help so we can have people in and out of the store getting those opportunities to do it. Probably the last one I'll pick up now before other people come in though is that um, obviously we've got all the different rules between Scotland and elsewhere. Two metre distancing in retail appears to be here for the foreseeable future. That's certainly what we've heard. So when we come on to discussions and how you calculate the capacity of people in your store, how you're measuring, how many people should be there. I would say that that's probably a big thing. We've still got two meters, lots of ventilation. But apart from that, it isn't hugely different from what we had beforehand, which is, is probably an evidence that it's quite good stuff. Excellent. Thanks, Ewan. Susan, anything you want to add to that? 
Yeah, so I think, as Ewan said, it's not so much the requirements themselves that, that have changed with this latest reopening after lockdown. It's more about the context being slightly different, and we'll probably come on to talk about that more during the discussion. Um, I think that one thing that Ewan mentioned there that is likely to change, we, we're just waiting for the detail on this, it's likely to be required now that you will put up a sign with your maximum capacity outside your premises. So most most premises were already working out what their maximum capacity was based on uh, its social distancing. However, now you are likely to be required to put a sign to that effect outside your uh, premises. So more detail on that when we get it. It's important to say that previously close contact services guidance was included within the retail guidance and now they're going to be separated out. The close contact guidance hasn't yet been published yet, the refresh, but it, but it, but it will be hopefully soon. And again, we also expect um, the retail guidance to be refreshed again too. One key point is just to bear in mind the breadth of what close contact covers. So it's often referred to in terms of beauty and hairdressing, but of course it covers a wide range of business activity where you come into close personal contact, physical contact with customers or others. So we, that would include all kinds of beauty and therapy related business, including things like um, massage or tattoos and piercing. Also covers things like indoor portrait photography, as well as dress design and fitting. So it's important to bear in mind it covers that broad range of business activities. My One of my tips to businesses who can feel a bit overwhelmed by all of this government guidance is that one, one positive development is that both sets of guidance now have a Q&A section towards the end of them. So if you flick down towards the end of the Q&A, and both will have a separate checklist as well. And the checklists have been refreshed to deal with the updated context. And if you do nothing else, go to the checklist and work your way through the checklist. That would be the easiest way to, to deal with the guidance. That's great. That's really useful advice on that, Susan. Uh, yeah, personally, I'm really looking forward to hairdressers opening up. So uh, that's going to be uh, my big thing. Um, Brian, anything else you want to add? Yeah, and the hairdressers are now open, actually, Hugh. So um, you've maybe I missed your see. opportunity because <laughs> the uh, appointments have all been taken. Um, and, that, and that's one of the, the points I'll, I'll make. Firstly, you know, I would um, I would just emphasise the, the points that you and, and Susan have made. You know, the... What we're looking at, business isn't greatly different than we were looking at before. But what we've what we've found with the new variant is that it takes any opportunity to spread. Um, the science behind it all is is getting clearer. You know, the route of transmission via the aerosol um, uh, route is the predominant one. That isn't to say the other routes uh, don't happen, but predominantly it's aerosol. So ventilation is really critical. Um, and there's a recognition that air conditioning. Um, so, you know, it's really just improving your ventilation as best as you can. And that can just be opening doors. Um, so one of the things that I would like to clar clarify right at the start is, you know, with the, the opening on um, the other Monday there, uh, with more retail opening and hairdressers and uh, barbers opening, is the, the introduction of the appointment system. So in the legislation, it said car showrooms must have appointments for people turning up. Um, fair enough. And it was the same for uh, hairdressers and barbers. Now, we know that most hairdressers have always operated a, an appointment system and have quite formalised ones. Barbers, less so. It's, it's more kind of turn up and, and get your hair cut. So um, initially, I think everyone's idea was the, the requirement for a kind of formalised um, appointment system. That is not the case. And because a lot of people had this idea that it was a formalised appointment system and people shouldn't just appear at your front door and then go in and get their hair cut, many businesses shut that front door, which if I go back to the original comments about ventilation, it really is, it's a its a critical area that we're actually creating, is creating a further problem. Um, so the appointment system has been clarified um, by uh, Scottish government. It doesn't have to be formalized. It can be informal. It's as much as someone coming to your front door and saying, would you be able to cut my hair today? And you can say, yes, um, if you come back in 10 minutes, give me your details. And you re the recording of the details is kind of important because that's the test and protect process. 
So just to Excellent. keep that uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian. Just a wee bit of a point of clarity, you and you you'd said there, you know, obviously that the two metre uh, distance thing will, will continue. Um, presumably, the whole facts process will still need to continue, face masks and so on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All, all the restrictions we had, all the kind of things we're used to. So things, all the sort of basic procedures I suspect we're used to when you go into a shop is hand sanitizer being available all the time. It's about things that will probably come onto clothing and kind of products, but you know, making sure we're not kind of having that physical contact. And again, face coverings, unless there's an exemption. And I, you know, helpfully remind everyone that the the responsibility for a face covering is on the individual. So that's both for your colleagues who have to wear one and indeed for, for customers as well. It's not a liability for the business. So it, it is their thing. And enforcement obviously is, is thankfully not a responsibility for retailers, albeit there's a, an encouragement to remind people. So signs up, so you know, wear a face covering. It's just not that hard, even though they're horrible. Just... That's great. Okay, um, moving on. In terms of COVID-19 and restrictions on retail, we expect to return to a level system on the 26th of April. For non-essential retailers, this will enable them to reopen, but what does the level system entail and what key things should business owners be aware of? Susan. Uh, thanks, you. So um, just briefly then, so the Scottish Government has decided that we will still have a levels system. So that's similar to what operated last autumn, and that will govern essentially what types of activity can happen under which levels. So it's it's actually it's just been updated. It's just been published recently. So that this is the one with the coloured boxes that people might be familiar with. You can get that on the Scottish Government uh, website. So that will tell you under which level uh, you'll be different activity can happen. The main change though is that compared to the the boxes that we had previously there have been some changes around what is enabled at different levels now. So if you remember previously, um, to be honest, large parts of the central belt in particular never got out of level three, which was quite a restrictive level. Now, what has been decided this time is that level three will um, will be will look different than it did before. And the fundamental change really is around travel. So previously under a level three, you weren't allowed to leave your own local authority area. What's going to happen now is that the whole country is going to move to level three uh, from 26th of April. And that means that everybody will be able to travel everywhere because we're all going to be in level three. And then the plan is that three weeks later, so the next review period, we will all move down to level two. And again, everybody will be able to travel. So for the, for the next foreseeable, the travel restrictions are more relaxed than they were under the previous system. Um, and uh, we, we hope that we'll continue to go down the levels in a fairly smooth pattern into the summer. So you can check all that out from the Scottish Government website. Great. That's smashing. Thanks, Susan. Anything, Brian or you, and you want to add to that? Or are you quite comfortable with that? I mean, it was a super explanation, wasn't it, Hugh? It I was. Think probably the thing I'd, I'd add from a, a kind of retailer perspective is that whilst obviously once we move to level three, all the restrictions on retail itself are, are, are lifted and we can get shops open, which is, is brilliant. There's still obviously those restrictions on close contact, also quite a lot of restrictions on hospitality. That may impact on where customers are traveling to or how they're coming in. We're not really anticipating the same rush back that you would sort of expect normally in high streets till we get a little bit more relaxation, particularly on the hospitality side. So that, that's just the only uh, addition I'd make to that. Okay, thanks, Ewan. I, I just, I suppose, a, a kind of extension on that in terms of those restrictions. What restrictions are still in place for retailers? Brian? Yeah, so at the moment, today, you know, there's only certain um, retailers that are allowed to open. Um, and we've already covered, you know, with, um, many of them anyway. Um, hairdressers and um, barbers were actually a wee bit of a surprise to us because of the, the closer nature. But, you know, what it is with Scottish Government, they look at the interactions um, they want to ease slowly. And it is important that we still proceed slowly because although we've got the vaccination programme progressing really well, there's still not that clarity over what um, protection it gives us from the transmission. And it's not 100% protection. Uh, just be aware of that. You know, so you can't just throw on your cloak of invisibility because you've gone through two very um, disturbing um, <laughs> vaccinations. Uh, if it's anything like my first one, um, it was 24 hours of abject misery. 
Um, and just keeping on the misery, I suppose it's up to me to be the doomsayer and say, yes, everyone is focused on how we're opening up. And hopefully, you know, please, we hope it's a smooth transition to the other side, to we get to the autumn and as much um, of the economy to, can return to as normal as possible. But what we need a wee bit of clarity on is when we get, and we will get outbursts, clusters, cases, outbreaks, etc., within areas. Um, we've seen that with the opening of the schools in some part. How does that affect um, the status of our level? Whether it holds up the whole nation or whether it's just one area. Now, we, we are obviously quite concerned because we saw different areas and different levels and all that happened was human behavior. You went to the level that you could do the most in, you know, and a lot of people just ignored the, the travel restrictions. We don't want to get to that because that will mean it inflames the whole situation uh, and more of the country could go back into lockdown. So there's a bit of discussion over that. We'll make sure that the messaging comes out so it's clear to everyone what is going to happen. We don't want businesses to open up and close back down. That's the worst thing that could happen. No, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, obviously, from the point of view that we're on a retail call here, you, you weren't really selling the vaccine there. So I will jump in and balance that by saying I have had so far one AstraZeneca jab and it was absolutely fine. So there we go. Um, right. So um, yeah, next... very sorry about that, Hugh. That's OK. <laughs> I shouldn't have been so negative. No, no, not a, not a problem. So. Um, in terms of the steps that businesses should be taking now to ensure they're in a strong position and able to reopen, Ewan, what's your thoughts on that? Thanks, Hugh. Uh, as somebody far too young to have had to deal with the vaccine yet, yeah, it's interesting to get a view into the future of what's coming. Um, sorry. Um, more seriously, uh, probably a couple of things. I think the points that we've raised from the guidance or rail about, you know, what's your plan for kind of managing customers and managing your stock? I'd say that's the, the most important thing to be considering. Now, does that mean you need to think about how do you are you going to have to have queuing outside is it worth speaking to shops nearby what, what's that going to look like you don't want people's queues kind of manning into each other and it's one of these things that i don't think uh, much as i would love government to solve every problem i don't think that realistically every shop in the country is going to be able to be managed centrally so that's just saying coherent on that what's your stock process do you have certain products that you're going to have to make sure need a quarantine system or returns it's getting those sort of things. And I think then the second bit is this question of calculation we of calculating capacity we mentioned. Work out what that looks like. Think, you know, what would be a reasonable way to kind of do that? And that kind of allows you then to plan other things, to make sure your store layout's appropriate for that. You don't really want tiny corners, you're going to force people into close proximity. And th those probably are the main ones beyond again that point on just how is the store going to be ventilated? How do you keep air coming through? And how do you also kind of make sure colleagues know what's expected of them, what isn't expected of them, or things like face coverings? It's, it's straightforward, but it's a lot of work, I know, for people getting ready for this. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Ewan. You spoke earlier, Susan, or you, you said you, a, a tip, and you gave us a tip there. What other tips would you would you have for folk? What's, what's your top 10 tips? Uh, yeah, so um, we're conscious that when these guidance documents are published, there's a lot of information. And that can be overwhelming for a lot of small businesses, particularly small businesses who are in a really desperate state because they've had over a year of struggling on and many of them don't know if their business is going to make it, whether they're going to be able to keep their staff. Lots of concern around their own family finances as well. So we wanted to try and think about how would we um, summarise what are the most important things to think about. So particularly in terms of reopening, um, shout out to Brian because we worked with him and his environmental health colleagues to try and boil it down to what are some of the, the, the most important things to bear in mind. So I'll very quickly sort of rattle through these. First thing is just to bear in mind those two points of context, which both Ewan and Brian have mentioned, but we really do need to keep mentioning them because this is what has changed since before Christmas. So the first is the, the circulation of the new variants, which are more transmissible. And these variants were not in circulation before Christmas. So this is new for a lot of businesses that have been closed. Second, as Brian mentioned, is the importance of ventilation. Got to think about the aerosol transmission of the virus more than we did before, because we understand more. So thinking about ventilation is much more important. So I've got five tips. The first is review your risk assessment and discuss it with your staff. So that's your starting point, is looking at the risk assessment you should have. Bear in mind the checklist that I said before, that's your good way to do it. 
discuss it with your staff so that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Second point is about, particularly if your premises, your building has been closed for a while, is checking that your utilities are safe for reopening. So thinking about any water that might have been uh, sitting in pipes for a long time, bacterial risks arising from that, checking any equipment um, that needs inspections, for example, that's not been used for a while. Third is get fresh air into your premises. Um, we cannot mention this enough because it's not something that previously was a strong message to business, but it is now. And as Brian said, the instinct quite often is to keep your door closed if you're trying to minimise the number of customers coming in and out of your premises. Whereas for a lot of small businesses, your front door and your window are probably the only source uh, of ventilation you've got, particularly for things like retail or, or hairdressing uh, premises. So get that fresh air in. Four is just remember your hand hygiene and cleaning schedule. So don't overlook the importance of making sure you've got a schedule, making sure you've got good facilities for hand washing and alcohol gel. And five is ensure your physical distance, distancing. So again, just revisit your measures to make sure that you're maintaining the two meter physical distancing for your staff, for your customers, especially at those pinch points. So maybe doors, stairs, break rooms, uh, outside toilets, these sort of areas where people come together and let, let their guard down. Think about how you're going to manage that in terms of um, limiting customer numbers, signage, screens. Um, you can find all of this peppered throughout the guidance. We have a blog on our website that summarises this, but that's trying to boil it down to you into five top tips, which are a good starting point for business. Great. Well, that's really helpful, Susan. Just while we're talking about that, then, what, what do you think or what what could you you could you could say in terms of resources or support that businesses could access to help them in then applying these top tips? So, um, so first of all, in terms of specifically about reopening, so lots of organisations like FSB will be on hand to help their members. So, if you're a member of ours, we have a staff team. You get in touch with us. We will help you. We will find the right answer for you if you've got a question. Um, secondly, of course, we've got lots of information on our on our website, um, on our COVID hub, and similarly, you can find all of the right information on uh, fi via Find Business Support. So if you get stuck, you'll find your way through Find Business Support, and also it's all on the Scottish Government website. Uh, another top tip: having spent far too many hours wading through the Scottish Government website, um, where it is you, it's difficult to find your way through it all, but Google Scottish Government COVID, right? When you find your way to Scottish Government homepage, there's a red bar at the top that says COVID. Just click on that, takes you into a drop down menu. That's the best way to find your way to all of the business uh, documents. Um, via that, via the guidance, you'll find links to lots of useful resources. So for example, we have things like templates for risk assessments. There's really good ones through Healthy Working Lives. So those are all there uh, to help you do this. If you want to refresh it, you want to remind yourself. Another uh, another really important thing to say is speak to your council. I'm sure, I mean, uh, Brian can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure he and his colleagues would rather you ask, get in touch and ask if you're not sure what to do. Um, just in terms of uh, wider support and resources, there's a limited amount now available in terms of direct financial support. So there were a whole range of grant schemes. Most of those have now closed um, a lot of businesses with premises, particularly retail, will have been eligible for the Strategic Framework Business Fund. So these were the sort of monthly grants that you got. So as far as we're aware, the final payments of that, so that'll be an extra boost, it'll be a larger payment. They are due next week, I think, on the 19th. Again, I'm looking to you and see if he nods if I've got that right or wrong. Um, so that is the final payment of the strategic fund. It's a larger payment because it's intended to sort of incorporate a restart grant. So watch out for that. The other source of funding that's available in some areas, and it very much depends on your business circumstance, is the discretionary grant schemes that councils are running. Some of those are open, some of them are opening. The, Criteria are different for each local authority area. It's worth looking if you feel that you're in need of support and you haven't qualified for other grants, it's worth exploring with your, your council. And of course, it goes without saying that there's a load of support available via Business Gateway as well, particularly around adapting your business, 
So we know that loads of businesses have um, have wanted to move their business online, for example, over the last year. Might be something that businesses are thinking about as they come to reopen. You know, we've been running webinars on that. I know that Gateway have have a lot of support in that as well. So always worth checking out Business Gateway site too. Yeah. Well, thank you for the plug there. Um, of course, if you hadn't said it, I would have. Uh, but there's loads of support, folks, through your local Business Gateway office, and absolutely businesses looking to to digital and online and what they need to do to, to digitise their business. We have the Digital Boost programme, which is helping with that. So lots of resources through that as well. You and anything else you would like to add to that in terms of resources or support? I mean, that was a, a fantastic summary by Susan. I, I couldn't remember all the exact dates for the retail grants myself, so I'm delighted that having had to check my notes, they were bound. One thing I admit, it's probably not relevant to most people on this, but for those businesses that might have been eligible or required to pay business rates, we obviously have a a business rates 100% relief for this year, but that's an application, so you have to actually commit to not getting that for businesses that would normally be paying business rates. So I just think that's worth flagging as quite a big deal. Uh, there's of course the expectation for some very, very large businesses that they won't take advantage of that, but uh, my supermarket members I'm sure could look after themselves on this one. Okay, that's that's great. Thanks for that, Ewan. Good point on the, on the rates relief. Okie dokie, let's move on, uh, conscious of time. Um, just, I suppose this one's really a, a question for Brian, particularly, how can businesses, we, I think we've probably kind of covered this in many ways, how can businesses mitigate the risk of spreading the virus? And we've, we've talked about ventilation, we've talked about following the guidance that's already there in terms of facts, the face coverings, the two metre distance. Is there anything we've not mentioned, Brian, in there about how they can mitigate that virus uh, transmission? Well, probably first I would emphasise that um, you know, the priority on the mitigations now has changed because of the, our understanding. Um, that's uh, the hounds from hell <laughs> welcoming the postman. <laughs> this is our uh, early morning. So anyway, um, the prioritisation of the mitigations is um, physical distancing first, ventilation, face coverings, and then cleaning and disinfection. So that's that's the kind of priority you as a business should be uh, should be looking at. What we've seen um, over the, the period of lockdown with the new variant is cases have occurred to happen um, and where they've actually taken hold in businesses and there's been transmission within the business, it, it's been down to things like car sharing, relaxation, um, uh, when people are on breaks, you know, they suddenly think, well, we're away from the front line, we're in the canteen or we're around um, the side of the building having a, a smoke, you know, and they just let their, their guard down. Many many of our workplaces are like a family to us all, and we see everyone as part of that family and forget actually they're a different household and there's implications if you if you don't follow through with all the mitigations throughout your your work. Um, understanding work cohorts as well, we've seen um, when I, and when I say work cohorts, it's like the bubble. You know, we're trying to get away from the bubble, so there's no confusion over a household bubble in a, um, a work cohort. Um, you hear in professional sport about them being in a bubble. Now you can't be in three different bubbles. You know, that defeats the purpose of having a cohort together. So if you have employees that have to travel to work together, then follow the car sh uh, sharing protocols and guidance, but keep them working all the way through the day together as well. And it, it gives you resilience should anything happen, and we hope it doesn't, but it will give your business that resilience to keep open. And lastly, just uh, um, Susan was talking about the, the pavement marking and, and, and talking to your neighbouring businesses about managing queues outside your premises. When you're in lockdown, people forget you're a business there. So queues tend to develop either side of the businesses that are still open and impact when you open up. So having that discussion early with your neighbouring businesses that maybe have been open sorts out any potential problems before they actually happen. And you can contact uh, the local authorities, we can help with pavement marking too. Great stuff, really useful advice. Um, I have to say all this talk of bubbles makes me want an Aero chocolate bar, but there you go. Um, so let us pick up the last week in a discussion point before we get into questions from, from folks. Susan, you, you were talking there about risk assessments. 
is, is there any training that employers should be undertaking so their staff and their teams are up to speed on guidance, on regulations, on, on things like risk assessment and so on? I think the most important thing is just to make sure that you are um, speaking to your staff uh, about, particularly about your risk assessment. So you should be involving your staff in your risk assessment and talking to them about it. We've mentioned some of this already. I mean, Brian's just mentioned a lot of the key points. Um, but when you're undertaking your risk assessment, that would include things like thinking about the, the risks or the support for individual members of staff. So, for example, members of staff that might have health conditions. Um, so thinking about that, um, make sure you discuss the, uh, the, the all, everything that you need to do in your business to keep your business safe and keep your staff and your customers safe. Make sure everybody understands what that takes. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to, to make sure everybody understands what it is they have to do. So that would include um, things that Brian's just mentioned. But for example, um, does it, is everybody clear about what happens if somebody feels ill? If somebody has symptoms, what do we do? Um, because we are aware that there, there are examples of confusion around this where people are coming into work between tests, for example. So make sure everybody understands uh, what it is they have to do. Make sure people understand the risks around um, sharing transport to and from work. So uh, I think from a business point of view, it's important to be clear about that. It's important to understand um, where that's happening with staff, make sure people mitigate it as much as possible. And as Brian said, one of the things that can help, which I've certainly um, spoken to a few small businesses about this, where it's possible, obviously it's not possible for the very smallest businesses, but where you can make yourself more resilient, thinking about staff bubbles, sorry, Brian, cohorts. So. If, you, if it's possible, thinking about your staff rotas, whereby you can keep different bubbles working so that if the worst happens, you minimise the impact on your whole business because you don't have the entire workforce having to self-isolate because you know that you've kept some staff separate. They haven't been in contact with each other. So it's just thinking about how some of these steps might help to protect your business, your staff and your customers. But Really, it all boils down to making sure that everybody feels involved and understands what it is we all have to do. Yeah, that's really good. You and anything you would want to add to that? I wish I had anything of a particular. I think it is exactly that point about, you know, and it depends on the scale you've got, whether you can create uh, cohorts, which it sounds like a Roman legion, but uh, that kind of how you can and how you build that resilience for the staff and create that environment too that you know if somebody is feeling ill that they're able to report that that they can then go off because actually what you don't want is people coming in and then your whole business is affected by it so that's that's probably the hardest thing at all within this i suspect um hopefully a problem you won't have but if it does it's about having that plan and being prepared for the kind of resilience in that circumstance can i Hugh, can i just quickly yeah. dive in i just wonder at this point just since we're talking about this whether it would be worth Brian just giving a, a, ve a very, very quick, what, what to do if one of your staff members says they've had a test? What, what are the sort of the key points for an employer to, to bear in mind if, if a staff member says they're symptomatic or they've been in touch with someone who's had a positive test? What, what, what should they do? Okay. There you go, yeah, Brian. No problem. <laughs> Thanks very much, Susan. Um, and maybe just take a step back from that actually so one of the one of the mitigations or one of the the assistance that can be provided and we're trying to we're trying to escalate this at local level as much as possible is the availability of lateral flow tests and um, so we're trying to make sure that they're available in all areas so that you as an employer can say to your staff now you know it, it's in some respects it's up to them whether they take up the offer but the opportunity to go along twice a week and take a lateral flow test, both for themselves, their family, and for for the business. Um, so if you go onto your, your local um, health protection team, your local um, NHS website, you should have, uh, there should be the details there of where the, the local community testing sites are. Um, and we're trying to, we're, as I say, we're trying to ramp up the scale of those. So someone um, someone reports they have symptoms. So immediately home, um, arrange a test. Um, if you have symptoms, it's going to be a PCR test. Um, if someone's gone out their own accord or has been a, a close contact and had to test, 
and becomes positive. That's another route they can do. Um, and as I've said, you can you can go along to the asymptomatic testing sites as well, um, whether you have symptoms or not. Um, so you might have a positive test there. In all circumstances, it's isolate. Um, test and protect will be in contact with you. So um, before that happens, there will be a time period. In some areas, it's really quick. In other areas, it can be a couple of hours. You know, it could be up to eight hours. So what you do is you think about how you can protect your business as best as possible. So you think about who has been in close contact with that individual and ask them to uh, to self-isolate as well. I think um, one of the important messages we've been saying to Scottish Government and to our health colleagues is the level of support that's available for people who are self-isolating um, has to be made as public as possible um, because there is good support, both in terms of the financial package, but also in terms of how you get your messages, who walks your dog, your medication, etc. So that's all taken care of at a local level for you if you have to self-isolate and you don't have anyone else to help you. Okay, that's really good. Thanks for that. So, um, conscious of time, let's get into some of the questions that we've received from uh, folks. And thank you all for, for submitting questions to us. As I said earlier, we, we will probably not get to all of them, but we will ensure that resources and so on are, are highlighted after this event that hopefully address the, the kind of questions that you've got. So the first question we've got is um, from Gail at Highland Glass and Ceramics. And thank you, Gail, for coming back to us and, and clarifying the, the, the question. Um, Gail was asking about, has there been any guidance issued regarding creative workshops? And particularly, what she's thinking about here is that although lockdown is restricted, she's not sure how to work out numbers or times that workshops can be held. Is there a limit as to numbers? And are they held to times to run workshops like pubs are for opening? Brian, can you offer any kind of guidance on that? Not definitive, unfortunately, at this time. Um, I haven't seen any update to the creative um, industries as yet. Um, we are working with Scottish Government in the background on these things, and there's a lot of work going on to make sure there's a consistent approach across all the guidance. As uh, Ewan and Susan have said, there's some work about capacities going, um, and that that's just getting cleared at the moment. So hopefully we should see something. But I think this this example is a perfect example of how a business can cut across many different sectors. It's not linear. You know, businesses nowadays have diversified. Um, I, I look at the levels document, and I think for this business, it's probably level one, level two. Um, but we should see more clarity in that in the next week or so, hopefully. If not, I, I can certainly take it up and um, um, ask Scottish Government colleagues for some more clarity on it and get back to the business. That would be great. Thanks, Brian. Um, second question we've got is from a small business that's teaching Pilates and yoga, who's using village hall venues to do so. Um, I guess there's another one for yourself, Brian. Can you tell the business when they'll be able to restart and what safety precautions they'll have to take? Now, we've talked a lot about the kind of safety precautions for, for retail. Is, is there anything you can say specifically to something like this business that's doing um, Pilates yoga in a village hall setting? Yeah, so for me, it's it's a similar kind of um, situation as gyms, and gyms are opening up to group sessions in level two. Um, I think um, village halls, village halls um, have been able to open if they are supporting um, addiction groups, etc. So um, they haven't closed. Um, it's about making sure that your class. Um, arrives at a staggered way so they don't all group together, that the class size is equal to the um, the social gathering limits, um, unless the, the specific guidance allows um, greater distancing. So we should see the gym guidance um, coming out very shortly again. Um, obviously, the individual exercise is allowed from the 26th, and you would be able to host your classes outdoors from the 26th as well. So that's maybe something for the business to consider um, to open up and, and provide that um, 
supportive fitness. Um, I do yoga myself and you know it, it really does help you. <laughs> Especially Excellent. when you're sitting eight hours a day. Yes, yes. No, I, I, I think... Level two is the 17th of May for that sport activity. At the moment, that's what's projected, isn't it? Okay. That's great. Thanks for that, Susan. Okay. Um, next question was from a business that's setting out its sales targets for the, the coming year and has made the comment that the business rates relief holiday has been a great help. Is there a revision of business rates planned to be in effect by the time the holiday ends so we can plan ahead with how many employees we can afford? Now, we, we talked briefly there, you and about the, the existing rates relief and the opportunity to, to apply for rates relief. Um, are we likely to see a further holiday beyond where we are? And I suppose that's wrapped up in certainly that's not something that local government can be doing because that originated from the UK government. Scottish government have applied it, and I guess what what next kind of thing. I mean, I, I have to be generous to the to the Scottish government. They, to be fair, actually went first on clarifying the the business rates relief in in Scotland, and actually have gone further than the UK government. So it's for the whole year and across yeah. for for retail, hospitality, and leisure. It's a, it's a huge boost. That's going to run obviously for 2021 to 2022. I would love to be able to tell you right now what's going to be in the Scottish budget in December. I think that it would be very optimistic for me to try and predict too much since we have an election, a UK budget, et cetera, to kind of come through that. Um, I, I, you know, so that's that's quite difficult. Well, it is probably worth noting, and I don't know if this is where the question was driving. There was meant to be a, a business rates revaluation next year. That's now been delayed further because of the pandemic, which is probably quite a sensible move. We certainly support that, but that is still on the horizon that there's going to be another revaluation. And because of the reforms that came through in the Non-Domestic Rates Act, there will be more frequent revaluations. They should be every three years now. So that on, on one hand should smooth things out and change some of those disparities. Against that, it means that those changes are going to be happening more frequently. So that, that may be the extent to my detailed knowledge of non-domestic rates, but I'm happy to try and answer anything else. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that, Ewan. Um, we kind of touched on this earlier very, very briefly. But the next question is to do with customers trying clothes on. Do the items then need to be quarantined for a period of time? And if so, how long? And also, does the same apply to children? Now, I'm, I'm guessing they mean uh, quarantining children's clothes, not actually quarantining the children themselves. Um, but you and you, you can have touched very briefly on, on, on clothing and, and, and so on. Any thoughts on this in terms of, of what's, what's needed? What's required? I imagine quarantining children is probably quite popular with those dealing with Zoom calls all day, but but that's perhaps out with our area. In terms of clothing, uh, clothing regardless of the, of the size or, or age of everything, at the moment, if it's returned or tried on, it has to be quarantined for 72 hours. That's longer than in the rest of the UK. That's the current position. The government is looking at that. That might change when the final guidance comes out, albeit I believe it's unlikely it will change. So that's where they are. And probably worth noting at this point that we have slightly different rules in Scotland and elsewhere on changing rooms. There isn't formal guidance around whether you can open a changing room or not. That's left at the discretion of the business. But with that caveat, of course, that if you do have a changing room open, you have to manage that very carefully to make sure that people aren't coming into close proximity. You're going to make sure that it's kind of kept clean, the sanitizer. But also, crucially, if people are trying on clothes in a changing room, they're also quarantined for 20, 72 hours as well. So that's a judgment call for a business is the is the opportunity of getting customers that that ability worth it versus the hassle that it might cause and that's just a, a judgment businesses have to take that's my understanding of where government's likely to end up on this it's certainly what they're saying now in the guidance uh, unless brian wants to correct me in which case his version's right <laughs> <laughs> no i would reiterate what you were saying you and i think one of the considerations for businesses is again down to that ventilation kind of issue you know Many fitting rooms tend to be away in a corner with no windows or doors, etc. So, you know, that's part of your consideration. If you're opening up, you're you're thinking about how you're going to refresh the air in that area. Yeah. And I guess as well, uh, picking up Susan's earlier comments about the, the risk assessment side of things and what you need to do to keep your staff safe and so on, you would need, I guess, in that situation as well, some protocols about how you then were handling those clothes from a from a quarantine point of view and and what the whoever your staff is doing that in terms of cleaning hands and so on needs to to take account of okay so next question um 
was from a, a couture dressmaker, um, which therefore goes under personal services. Um, when they sell wedding dresses, uh, are they classified as retail? And can we please let them know if clients, usually brides, are allowed to bring a visitor, uh, which would invariably perhaps be their mums, for the dress fittings? Uh, doesn't appear to be clear from the guidelines. Brian, can you pick that one up? Yeah, no problem, Hughes. Uh, so, close contact services are not permitted at present, but will be from the 26th. And that would include, as Susan's already said, dress fitting, shoe fitting, kilt fitting. Um, from the 26th, you know, obviously people are allowed indoors into your shop. And so the socialising rules apply if you are um, doing something um, like this. So it's the four, four people from two households. So as long as you have some kind of um, uh, assurance about that, then it's fine. No problem at all. And obviously that changes as we go up the level. So from the 17th of May, it's likely to go up to six people from two households. So. Just keep okay. your eye on that as we move through. So from the 26th, mums and brides-to-be will to get together for, for yeah. dress and things and so on. That's and the, the only thing I would caution against, because mm. having gone through the process a, a few times myself, I know that alcohol is sometimes involved in the, the dress fitting scenario. And at the present, you can't do that indoors. OK, that's a helpful additional advice and has given rise to a line of inquiry that I will pursue later on in terms of what you've just said, but there we go. Okay, um, next question we have is, could we get a definitive date that small ship cruising, i.e. 12 passengers or less, can restart? Can't get any real info on that. Um, concerns about not being able to start this year because that, that could mean pressure on the business and therefore jobs. Um, not about day boats or large cruise ships, but small liveaboard under 24 metre boats, which is, is very specific. Um, I'm going to throw that open if anyone has any thoughts or views on that. Uh, I can just give a, 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 I can't answer the question. I don't think there is an answer yet. Um, right. I'm aware of that. Um, so as, as we mentioned earlier, um, the beauty of the small business sector is its sheer diversity. So there are all kinds of business activities um, that are obviously, and each individual business obviously absolutely critical to the people that, that work in it and run it. Yeah. The challenge is that quite a lot of the guidance is quite high level in terms of very broad sectors um, of business activity. Um, so just within tourism alone, we know that there are a range of types of business activity where there's a need for clarity over what about my particular sector. So I can only say that I know, having been in meetings about it, that all manner of cruise ships, whether those are smaller boats or large boats, is something that there are a lot of discussions going on about right now uh, involving um, you know, organisations like ourselves, Scottish Tourism Alliance, Sales Scotland. I know those discussions are happening. We'll get clarification as soon as we possibly can. I don't know if Brian's got anything specific to add. Yeah, and what's not clear from uh, the information that we're given, whether or not there's crew members aboard, or whether or not um, it's the the leasee that actually just um, mans the ship themselves, if that's the correct uh, nautical term. Because I think if there's no crew member aboard, if it's the 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 leasee that and their family, then it's just like um, a B and B, you know, an Airbnb or whatever. So that would be allowed, I think, from level three as soon as you're allowed overnight accommodation but the 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 socializing rules limits would apply so um that would be the only stipulation yeah but as you say that is it's not particularly clear from from the question there what the circumstances are uh, it's probably person the ship these days um rather than man the ship um okay so how can we get funding and what are requirements during covid19 as we've not been working for a year. Now, obviously, that is a, um, quite a generic question, or, or and very, well, generic generally, but specific to the person. It depends entirely on your circumstances. As Susan touched on earlier, there have been a variety of grants available for different businesses um, throughout the pandemic. I guess it depends on your circumstances and on whoever that was, I would suggest contact your local council, as Susan was suggesting earlier, and see what resources and support might be available to you. That's the best advice we can give you on that one. Okay, um, 
We're looking to expand our operation. Could you tell me if there are any grants or RSA, that's regional sort of assistance, incentives available? Machinery purchase, rates relief, IT installation, etc., to help us grow, or are we better to look outside the area? Um, again, my advice on that one would be contact the local council and the business gateway service and see what advice and support you can get there. Okay. And hopefully you'll be able to get it where you are um, and get the support where you are. You don't have to move out the area. And I'm not saying what area it is. Be very careful about that. Now, we've got a number of questions which are specific to um, beauty industry or close contact services. Now, a number of these refer to, and we've, we've talked about this already, um, and it's about PPE and face masks and so on. So I think, and I hope, in terms of those, the, the, the message that we've got across, I hope, this morning is, yes, retail's opening, close contact services are opening, but there are still clear guiding, guidelines that need to be followed in terms of face masks, two meter distancing, the cleanliness, all of these things still need to be followed and will need to be followed for some time yet. Uh, because as we've touched on this morning, there are variations of this virus appearing, they are more transmissible. So we need to be cautious, we need to be careful, we need to keep following the rules and the guidance that's there and keep ourselves and everyone around us safe. Is there anything else we want to add to that folks or have we really covered that one? Can I, can I just make a point on this? I'm yeah. the, the, um, his perspective on it as well. So I, I just want to say that from, from the business point of view, um, we are repeatedly highlighting to the government the difference between a business being open as opposed to your business being viable. So we're entering this really difficult period now where a lot of the financial support is going to come to an end because technically businesses can reopen. Not all businesses, but a lot of business activity can reopen. And ourselves, Ewan's organisation, lots of other business organisations are repeatedly making the point that we're nowhere near back to normal for so many types mm. of business and the jobs that depend on it. Now, one of the ones that's most often in the media is obviously around hospitality. So we often hear about all of the rules associated with hospitality and the challenges that those will um, create for those businesses being able to operate. But one example that we have highlighted, which gets a bit less publicity, is about the beauty industry in particular, and this restriction on um, the high risk patient zone, and what it means for those businesses if they cannot offer any of those treatments because a face covering cannot be removed. Now, as far as I understand it, the guidance that will be published shortly will continue that requirement that the face coverings cannot be removed during treatments once, once um, close contact is allowed to start operating again. And therefore, treatments that, that or you can only do treatments that don't that allow a mask to be removed and that can be done from behind or from the side. And that clearly creates a real problem for so many beauty businesses that are involved in whether it's makeup or other facial treatments. Um, I can only say that we will keep making that point to the Scottish Government. We recognise the risk, but I think a lot of businesses make some very fair points about other comparisons of other activity and it being very difficult to understand why, with all of the measures they're taking, we could think about how we could change this. Language. So we are trying our best to, to highlight those, those great difficulties. Um, but I guess Brian will have a, a different perspective on that. Okay, Brian, anything you want to add yeah. there? Well, firstly, some of the differences. So um, it's often mentioned how um, some of the clinics can offer the, the same treatments um, that our high street beauticians can. So we we recognised this and thought there was an inconsistency. So we approached Scottish government and eventually got in contact with um, um, the, the Scottish um, Improvement Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So they register all these aesthetic clinics. So they have made clear to all those businesses that are registered with them that they can only carry out these uh, treatments in the high-risk zone 
if there's a medical need. So there has to be a medical assessment for that treatment to be carried out. And you know, we we sympathise with the, our high street uh, beautician businesses because it, it's quite clear there was a disparity there. Hopefully, we will see um, the the guidance from Healthcare um, Improvement Scotland being followed. Um, and we won't see a drift of customers from our businesses to those businesses. Um, the assurance I would give is that Scottish Government colleagues are continually monitoring the situation. And in some respects, and I know it probably doesn't appease you, um, the fact that some of the, the rest of the UK are opening up slightly earlier is actually good for us because we don't want you to open and then shut back down again. We don't want you to have on your conscience the fact that people have become ill because of treatments that you have given, or you yourself have become ill. So um, we'll see how it goes in England and Wales. Um, there's, as I say, there's continual assessments on this to make sure that Scotland isn't being put at an economic disadvantage. Um, and it's, it's a wait and see, I'm sorry, um, but that's all the assurance I can give at the moment. Okay. I'm, I'm very conscious of time here, so I'm going to pick one last question. Um, and this one, someone who's been in correspondence with the Scottish Government, they've been struggling to get a, uh, an answer. They've decided that they, well, the Scottish Government, have decided that the business is close contact retail business. However, what the business does is provides a service of photography workshops that are held through a combination of outdoors and on Zoom. So two questions. Are maximum group sizes determined by the rule of six, or could I could they use the same guidance as personal trainers who are able to operate with 15 attendees? If it's the rule of six, do does the, the trainer count as one of them? That's the first question. Let's see if we can get that one answered. Brian, Susan, anyone? Anyway. I think it's the one for Brian. Yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> I thought that too, Susan. Pass, eh? Um, I think the Very rule of six. Is, I, I think the rule of six of UK and Wales. Uh, I don't think that applies in Scotland. So uh, in Scotland, all the all the um, gathering sizes are based on the socialising sizes. So it's two to four at start. Uh, it'll then go to two to six, and then it progressively increases. So um, yeah. okay, I think unfortunately that is all we are going to have time for today, as it approaches twelve o'clock. So it basically leaves me to say to our three panellists, thank you all incredibly much for what you've done for us today. Another great session, fantastic advice, really helpful for people. And to everyone on the call, if we didn't get to your question, sorry about that, but as you'll have seen, we have a lot of material to try and cover. We will follow this up with information and hopefully Everything will go smoothly for you as we go forward. So take care, look after yourselves, and uh, enjoy the freedom of shopping when it arrives. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye, folks.